Hi everyone, this is Al McKay. Welcome to episode 153. I'm speaking with Ryan Connolly from Film Riot, the director of Ballistic, as well as a lot of other really amazing short films. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Okay, so welcome to a brand new episode. I want to quickly just say that this is going to be a killer episode. I got to sit down with Ryan Connolly. We did an episode a couple of months back, uh, which was really great, really insightful. We got into so many cool things. And then this episode is specifically around his latest short film, which you have to check out, Ballistic. And there'll be links in the show notes to this if you want to go to alanmckay.com slash 153 for episode 153. In addition to that... Uh, there should be a link to the new free book, The Ultimate Demo Reel Guide, which I know you're going to love. Uh, we spent a lot of time on this. This is something I, I wanted to write to build out something that will set the tone right for what to do to build a killer reel, to land the job, all the things that we should avoid. And I feel like this is the only real material out there, which is ballsy to say and cocky to say, but I mean it sincerely that I feel it is really accurate from the perspective of someone who actually does the hiring, okay? Because there's a lot of information out there that I feel is more damaging than good, and just a lot of assumptions from artists who aren't there actually telling people they got the job or telling other people they didn't get the job. Now, I've hired thousands of people, I've assembled hundreds of teams, and I've looked at tens of thousands of reels, so I'm well aware of not only my own decisions, but working with so many other producers, supervisors, and other teams of, of management who I've watched throw reels out for such simple reasons. And I want to really make this as accurate as possible to benefit you as much as possible. So that being said, if you want to get the free Ultimate Demo Reel book, you can go to alamckay.com slash myreel, one word, myreel, and you can get it there. And it's also going to be on Amazon for about 20 bucks, Audible for 35 bucks uh, pretty soon. But this is where you can get it for free um, just by going on there, as well as a free advanced masterclass on some really cool stuff. So alamckay.com slash myreel, check it out there. That being said, we're going to get in some really amazing stuff here. I'm excited to chat with Ryan. We got into a lot of the behind the scenes on the production of his new short film, ballistic and going through uh, a lot of really great information that he shares and a lot of um, his mindsets around it as well so that being said let's dive in yeah again thanks for taking the time to chat and do you want to quickly introduce yourself uh sure i'm ryan conley i'm a filmmaker uh i got my start sort of uh by doing a um uh, an online show called film riot which is like a weekly sort of how to i hate calling it a how-to show because it's like i guess it's a how-to show because showing how i do things but that was always the idea of showing how i go about um doing things not necessarily this is how you you should do them uh with the idea that it would track my career over time leading to uh my first feature started that uh like nine years ago been doing that ever since that's great man cool and how is film right going anyway great uh it's it's headed towards where i've always wanted it to head toward where it's like a little bit of everything um you know now especially with ballistic we're getting into uh much higher end more pro proper production but we are also doing you know next week we're shooting a thing inside the office with one camera zero budget uh and it's going to be a visual effect that you know anybody can do um to you know we have a couple of diy builds coming so it's like everything from these much bigger productions with an 80 person crew down to a two person crew with a (laughs) a boom mic on a stand because we don't have enough people in zero dollars so it's that mixture of those two things and ultimately 
you know, when I'm doing the first feature, Film Riot will keep going. And I would love for it to be a thing where it's like, you know, two episodes a week. One episode is a little bit more of, you know, the old school Film Riot, zero budget type stuff. And the other one's the more pro level stuff. So you're getting the best of both worlds constantly. Because really the idea behind Film Riot has always been to kind of be an online film school of sorts. Uh, mm -hmm. as we as we get deeper and deeper into it you know as i'm able to bring in more and more pros to you know give give uh their view on you know their craft uh hopefully it, it turns into that that's cool i mean i guess in a lot of ways it is kind of a well especially now it can be a platform to document a lot of what you're doing and get to kind of show that process i think it's kind of cool though because you're right i think that everyone is always going to have that thing of like, great, I'm learning high end stuff, but I'm not there yet. How do I like none of this applies to me, which, you know, people are always going to have that look for the the reason that this won't work for them. But if, yeah, if you totally. are going to showing both spectrums, then, you know, they can, they can connect the dots. Yeah. And I'm always trying to, um, to, to put it out there that even the high end stuff does relate to somebody with zero dollars, uh, you know, uh, their iPhone and two friends. It still relates because I always talk about um, uh, movie magic, the old Discovery Channel show. That's that was like mm -hmm. my film riot back in the day. And this is showing how they did the practical and visual effects for like Independence Day and Terminator 2 and things like that. Obviously, as like a 14 year old, there's no way in hell I could have done any of that stuff. I had a VHS camera and two VCRs to try to edit it with. Um, but I was able to take sort of the ideas and the creativity and the inspiration behind what they were doing and then transfer that into how I did it. Because, I mean, the ideas are all the same. Force perspective is force perspective, regardless if you're Peter Jackson doing it for Lord of the Rings or if you're some kid doing it in your house. You could still pull off a version of that. Uh, so there's always like ideas to the process that you, that you can take to educate yourself into, you know, utilizing for whatever you're doing right now. And, and that's always been the stuff that has taught me the most uh got me thinking outside the box the most and doing my own thing the most like seeing how people on my level with my budget are doing things that i could literally just take and do is just a copy paste and you don't really want that as much as you want the inspiration of process i personally think mm -hmm. yeah no i think it's great advice and you're absolutely right i think that um these days i mean hell we've got feature films being shot on iphones now so yeah that, that yeah. kind of eliminates like any excuse that you have the, the thing uh, that bums me out though is like you have a feature shooting on an iphone or we did an episode shooting on an iphone and then you always have people which is just a defeatist attitude which always makes me be like man i'm i'm concerned for those people because it's like you know you, you're in danger of not going anywhere because of your mindset is you know all oh, this feature was shot on an iphone that's so inspirational and then immediately well yeah but look at all the gear they have around the iphone it's like okay you're completely <laughs> missing the point here man that's exactly my point that um you know i, I think there are certain people it's it's pretty common psychology to have like that where, wherever it's going to be there's usually the internal and ex external so it's going to be um either i can't do this because i don't have enough experience then it's like well okay i don't have the equipment you know it's going to be two things that they're going to try to use to say well i don't need to try but it's like look you know you're the only person holding yourself back so get your yeah. iphone get out there and you know you can uh, just experiment and i think the the biggest thing for me has always been just to fail fast you know and, and keep kind of um aggressively using that to kind of learn and better your process oh man i i agree with that so much I, I think like that sort of mindset seems to come from like the majority of like two places either one laziness where in which case just don't do this career because <laughs> you, you can't have that or two a fear of failure which you just need to get over because you, you just have to fail constantly that's the only way to learn and, and progress yeah absolutely and just curious like do you think do you kind of believe there's any fear of success as well because I, I always find like fear of failure is, is a really big one that prevents people from trying because they're afraid of you know usually it's the external of like people judging them or or whatever it's going to be but then i think that there is also the crushing thing of like fear of success because then then uh, it's kind of like all right if if i do succeed then i'm gonna actually be out there and have the world the weight of the world on my shoulders so you know it's it's more comforting to be a dream let's say with you when totally. you make a feature film you know to get out there and be like okay now i'm gonna make a feature film 
fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I relate to that 100%. I have that, but, you know, I I have both fear of failure and fear of success. I mean, I, I don't think – I think almost everyone does if you're really thinking about it. You just can't let it stop you. It's just – for me, it's like making films is an absolute have to. I mean, obviously, it's a want to too, but it's more of a have to <laughs> um, uh, because that I've been saying it a lot lately. Like, the deeper I get into this, it how stressful it is, how hard it is, it's like why would anyone – actually want to do this unless they had to do this they like had no choice uh because it can be like soul deadening at times you know <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. you put your heart and soul into a thing and then you, you know you read some pretty harsh comments on it so it's it can be a very difficult thing to do and yeah fear of success is definitely a big one because the wider audience you put out to a thing the more harsh feedback you're gonna get on top of that even before you put the thing out you go on to set like i did with ballistic and you have like 85 people looking at you going okay now what um so you know all that stuff is extremely uncomfortable you you have to be willing and ready to put yourself in the most uncomfortable circumstances especially with a personality like mine i'm not like the most outgoing person <laughs> I'm, mm -hmm. I'm i'm pretty introverted for the most part it doesn't look like that online but you know you put me in front of a camera and i'll i'll be loud but you put me in a party i'm probably quiet and in the corner so you know it's i'm it, the exact opposite <laughs> <laughs> i wish I, I wish i was because you know it's it's uh being a director on set kind of goes against my core personality but it's like i don't have a choice i have to do this you know so uh yeah i totally relate to the the fear of success thing mm -hmm. that's awesome man and ballistic i mean you know last time we chatted you were just about to get into it all and i'm curious like uh how's it been received so far really good um <clears throat> i'm i'm pretty happy with it uh with with the reception you know it's it's funny it's uh whenever you put something out you can have like a hundred really great comments and one really bad one and then in your mind there was a hundred really bad comments yeah the, the good old really internet great. math yeah <laughs> i like talked point zero 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 one percent <laughs> yeah Man, what's your problem uh-huh i i and i talk about it every time because no matter how conscious i am of it it doesn't matter it still feels that way it's so loud and it's just such a gut punch and and it and it's not even like it, the this the stuff like hey i didn't like this doesn't bother me at all it's like that's fair enough not everybody's gonna like it uh it's the stuff that's like dismissive of your work that's like ouch <laughs> you know mm -hmm. or that calls it lazy or something and you just want to be like do you have any idea how much i didn't sleep for this thing um mm -hmm. but but yeah overall it's been great and i think the thumbs up thumbs down is the best indicator not comments um because the majority of people like me i i rarely comment i'll give it a thumbs up or thumbs down but i rarely jump into comments um so you know we always track that and uh that is if we consider that rotten tomatoes <laughs> it, yeah. it it it's uh doing very well it got a very good reaction um yeah man and it's uh it's doing its work overall i'll say uh behind the scenes as well congratulations by the way thank you and um no you're absolutely right like it's it's really funny but i <laughs> I, I went on a bit of a rant over the weekend where i posted some information on like instagram just about like um ways that you can make money and kind of like the four minute mile of like, you know, you got most artists are making this much money, then you got a few are doing exceptionally well. And it's because they're able to kind of like not follow what everyone else is doing. And, and therefore, you know, so the whole point was I posted a thing saying, does anyone want me to do a live stream on how to, you know, how I can show you guys how to make money as an artist and leverage everything you're doing. What, what I find is interesting about that is that you get, it was like 90% say yes. And there's that 10% who say no. And it's just like, what is wrong with that 10%? Like it's, it's kind of right. like with anything, it's like, what, what is wrong with you? You know? And, um, yeah, I, I it's just, it's just funny to kind of see like, okay, like I want to know more about these people. Cause it's just for, for you to, to not get it. You know, it's like, I posted, um, not to make it about me, but I posted, I was redoing the, the shot from scanners with a big head explosion. And, um, the actor I, I had like the talent doing the shot, like he had his hands closed. And so I posted like a work in progress somewhere and like everyone goes crazy, but one person's like, yeah, but the guy's hands cl are closed, you know? And it's just like, what the fuck are you looking at? Like why <laughs> is it brains going everywhere? Is blood going? You're looking at the guy's hands and saying like, that isn't realistic. Like I could get into the, the nerves and, you know, get it, forget it. Like you're, you're clearly got something wrong with you, but you're right. Like everyone's entitled to an opinion, but it's just like, I think that most people you you want them to be aligned with your vision because it's just easy to be like you know sit there on the other side of the screen forget dismiss all the amount of work and the 
the whole path that you've had to get to that point and just be like, eh, this sucks. I'm going to go back to watching, you know, anime or whatever I'm, I'm into. So yeah, it sucks when you, you come across that. Yeah. The, the entitled to opinion thing is something I've been thinking about a lot recently because it's like, I think just, uh, criticism has gotten to a really weird place where it's like especially the anonymous um, ones as well totally because i mean yeah you're in in, i I feel like yeah you're totally entitled to like or not like something but we've gotten to this place where it's um everyone acting like a film professor like you're coming on Mm -hmm. to you know uh someone's work and then putting in critique that wasn't asked for and be you know it's it's like it's a reason i hate video essays is you know you have someone telling a filmmaker what they did wrong and and how they should have fixed it which is like wait what (laughs) (laughs) what and it's and it's done in an objective way not a subjective way and it's that's it's just so strange very very strange i mean i i love the subjective hey i didn't like this this is why it didn't work for me there's tons of that and i had a bunch of conversations with people online i love that i want to hear that that's really helpful but uh then there's the people that are just like i hated this it sucked uh, here's what you should have done <laughs> and that's the stuff where it's like oh boy you did a love story completely different script <laughs> totally <concept>. dude totally <laughs> like somebody tried to rewrite and it was like the most obvious that that's the other thing where it's like man come on i didn't do that because that would have been the most obvious thing to do type of Mm. stuff and um but they like completely rewrote the ending in like in the comments and i was just like oh my god it's it's very strange it's gotten very strange i keep i keep threatening that i'm gonna do a whole like podcast on the the state of criticism today oh trust me like um every time i get like someone apply for a job and they send me an email which is just so terribly written i collect all the stuff because i just want to do like a tear down but i don't want to hurt anyone's feelings but it's just like all right you know ccing other companies because you just want to write one email <laughs> to, to apply for a job at several places or, or you know all the different uh things people are doing wrong it's just kind of like or commanding or sorry demanding you know give me a job you know like just the the things people do, you want to kind of turn around and say, okay, let me write my video essay on, you know, on all the 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 wrong level headedness that you guys have of um of all this stuff. So right, right. You know, it, it almost is like time to be like, okay, time for me to troll back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Let's totally. Let's go through this. And it, it's such a hard thing to do too, because I'm a creator, which means you're not allowed to you're not allowed to say anything because then you're like sensitive and you can't take criticism. It's like, well, no, that's not the thing at all. It's like bring on the criticism. It's like I always have to preference that. It's like I get tons of criticism and I I welcome it. I, I even thank people for it. Well, thanks for your feedback. You know, it's. It's the very specific ones, uh, like I was talking about, like that one. Um, and eh, never mind, I won't name names. But <laughs> 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 I was going to talk about a video essay, but I'm just going to leave it alone. If you if you want, we can we can stop it, and this could be his therapy for a moment. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> it won't go out. <laughs> could we could we pause the recording for a minute? <laughs> get on the couch. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get it. I, I, you know, I, again, like you know, especially having such a wide audience. Like I, I think that if you were to do it in percentages, that way, it's like you got four people in a room and one person hates it it's probably gonna not even that it's like 10 people in the room and you know half of a person hates it and that's the same math when you scale that up to a million people it's it's gonna be um you know, yeah such a small percentage i'm sure rather yeah than it being like you know holy shit like you know i'm looking at the film right now it's like uh, 400 dislikes twelve thousand likes and they're just the people who had the um the energy to actually click the like button instead of being like like me okay i'm gonna click like <laughs> instead of being like holy shit that's fucking amazing i love that i watched that with my fiance and she she literally just before that was watching um a marvel movie and tearing it apart the whole way and so i watched it with her and she's like holy crap this is amazing and it's like wouldn't shut up so i'm like all right like, that's she, awesome there man. you go but you know then you got the usually it's the people hitting the like button who are so strong opinionated about having to hate on everything so yeah it's been it's yeah. been a very difficult uh I, i'm pretty good with it now but like some people aren't gonna like this you know what i mean like no matter mm-hmm. what you make there's gonna be a lot of people who just don't like it that's just the nature of it um and it, it's hard because you're like please love my baby do you do you ever watch honest uh, uh movie trailers no i don't i don't okay. watch any of those like honest trailers cinema sins all that stuff <laughs> i stay clear I, I, it's it's my one crack you know it's just like i i never really went on youtube until it ended up on tv now i'm now i'm like holy crap this is like netflix and everything else times a million because it's it's actually got more options out there so i end up just watching them all day long and uh i was watching an interview with the directors of john wick and um 
you know, they were saying they're, they're pretty much keeping the honest movie trailers in mind when they were shooting it all. Like, what can we do to not <laughs> get picked on when it comes to uh, to the, the post process? Yeah, um, th- that stuff bugs me, like Cinecins, Honest Trailers, all that. I, I don't like those because although it can be funny, it's like it, putting in the mindset of nothing, you know, it, it, it can't be loose. There can't just be magic to it. it you mm-hmm. know what I mean? You can go back to any of the movies from the 80s and rip them to absolute shreds. And they're some of the greatest films of all time because they were unconcerned about dotting every I and crossing every T. They were completely concerned in, you know, building in that movie magic. And now everything has to be so you know literal and correct and uh, like you said uh, his hands were crossed who cares Mm -hmm. (laughs) who cares you know that would never happen is who (laughs) cares it's a movie of course it would never happen it's a fable uh yeah sorry go ahead no no that's it that's my rant uh, (laughs) (laughs) um we'll get back on point in a a second i promise but um no it's gonna like marvel i keep defending their stuff but it's because for me i'm kind of uh, I guess ingesting it or digesting it, sorry, um, through more the perspective of, of a comic, you know? So it yeah, is like, exactly. yeah, like if this was framed as a comic, it's going to be over the top. It's going to be elaborate. There's going to be like really cool moments that are just completely ridiculous. But, you know, you take it that way. You're not taking it like, you know, this is a Spielberg film and, you know, it's a, a remake of, of history. It's like, no, it's a fucking people firing. You know, totally. Yeah. <laughs> stupid. Yeah. And uh, of course, history. like you're saying, they're, they're going to be held on different levels. Like you have the Marvel yeah. movie level and then you have the alien level, which is still sci fi and fantasy. But it's it's done a little more realistically, but you mm-hmm. should be able to suspend quite a bit. And then you have like, you know, um saving private riot that better be pretty freaking accurate (laughs) you know what i mean there's there's just like different levels of film of course held to to different standards but you know even a lot of the a lot of the stuff you see online is picking on like lord of the rings (laughs) it's like dude (laughs) come on really (laughs) if like you didn't my thing is always because because a a lot of people are calling things plot holes which are actually not at all plot holes because of some of these things and Mm -hmm. uh my thing is also well, did you think about that while you were watching the film the first time? No is usually the answer. And like, okay, so the filmmaker did their job. It's not a problem. That's right. And then you just add on STFU at the end of it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, you're absolutely right. And yeah, I don't mean to kind of keep getting into the, like, I guess because you're on YouTube, people are always a bit more brutal. So I I never intended it because I know last time we actually dived a lot into trolls and it was really fascinating again to, to hear someone who's able to approach it so kind of openly without it being you know like a, a big sore point because you're right like when it comes down to it you're gonna get people who like it then usually the people who don't like it are a hundred times more vocal than than everyone else so yeah if totally. anything if you were to do, do, do the math i think it would be basically to, to add an extra digit onto anything that's liked so instead of 12 it's 120 you know you know basically it's just like that's what you got to look at is like you know most people are not going to be vocal except for those you know a couple of people who actually are like just kind of living and breathing through the internet yeah totally and i i mean i love talking about this stuff because i am actually concerned about like you know although it is the minority of voices that are saying uh like the the type of comments that i'm talking about which i think are really negative towards the community as a whole where it's they think it's objective and all that stuff that's definitely the fewer group um the majority you know come with actual constructive criticism even if they like some guy one guy was like uh sorry i like most of your stuff but i hated this (laughs) and i'm like fair enough and uh he even told his reason why he hated it and i was like that's great thanks for the feedback it's it's great Mm -hmm. to know you know that's a good learning experience as me as a creator i want to know you know the different audiences that are watching this and how they're feeling that's great um mm-hmm. it's just that there's this small section and and you know it's usually you, you know those small sections which feel the loudest which do end up poisoning the community so that's always a concern of mine because you've seen that with some of the the stuff that is online to where now people are you know tweeting to me about oh do you this film or oh, watch this video this film it makes so much sense these plot holes and i'm like those aren't plot holes at all mm. um so it's like it's that stuff that's always kind of concerning where it's like it seems like everything's leading towards such cynicism that it's going to start infecting the films that we get and i want films to stay you know magic that's right cool no i i I love it and you're yeah again it's the internet (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's a it's a fascinating place it is um what 
Yeah, it's, it's kind of like when you go to certain countries, especially living in America, and, and you forget, like, how kind of open and honest people are about stuff. And so it's like, oh, wow, like, you, you wouldn't say <laughs> that. That was blunt. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I guess, like, where did the original concept come from uh, for this? I mean, <clears throat> is it something that you, you've you had kind of in your back pocket for many years? or? Well, it started with Proximity back in 2013. I was working on another short. It would have been the biggest short I ever made, even still. It was like $300,000 short film. Um, it was definitely reaching just a smidge too high, so it was probably good that it didn't work. I think we would have got it done. It would have been awesome, but you know, it was... <coughs> It was a good learning experience overall in the end. But basically, it was a $300,000 short film. We were shooting it in Austin, huge crew, 100-person zombie day at one point. It was like this oh. uh, unofficial Walking Dead sort of thing, um, like my ver sort of my version of what Fear the Walking Dead ended up being before Fear the Walking Dead <clears throat> was out, where it was like just a different group at a different part, what's going on over here mm -hmm. uh, in the Walking Dead universe. Um and we had like the makeup artist that worked on some of the Resident Evil films. We had a guy that worked on Transformer building some sets for us down there. It was it was crazy. It was madness. <laughs> and then in the last hour, you know, uh, the Friday before the Monday we were about to start shooting, a huge chunk of the financing fell through, and I just had to call the whole thing off, um, which I had been like grasping onto like you know straws trying to keep the thing. Uh, together up until that point and and then th that happened it was like yeah there's just there's no way that we can do yeah. this so i had to, so i called my makeup artist and i'm like hey man here's what happened he's like oh crap i'll call you right back and he called me back he's like <laughs> i had to run to fedex and stop the shipment it was like a thousand dollar shipment and i was like oh my god thank you because <laughs> oh, uh, we just ate like a huge cost on that because i was just fronting the money for everything waiting for the financing to come through and then it didn't so i just i just lost a ton of money on that um so he, he him and others were cool enough to like go out of their way to try to help us you know save money but uh we i had to call all the actors and tell them and everybody was so great about it everyone was just like hey this actually happens all the time don't worry they were more concerned about me than the project falling through <laughs> it was it was very nice and then uh but then there were some people already on their way there just two actually uh justin robinson who later ended up working for me for a little while and uh, my composer daniel james and and uh daniel was like leaving the next day and i was skyping with him and we were all talking or we like you know what let's let's put our money where our mouth is I always say, you know, whenever something falls through, push harder. I'm like, let's just do that. You know, and it was it was Daniel really pushing me and being like, come on, man, let's do it. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? You're right. Let's do it. So in 10 days, uh, we wrote shot um, proximity uh, for I think it was like 300 bucks because, you know, all the budgeting fell through. And we had a camera wow. that a friend of mine lent, which was the Canon C500. So it was just me and a teeny tiny like borderline non-existent crew um and just whatever we could scrounge together to make a thing and um <clears throat> after making that it's still one of my favorite shorts that we've ever made um i you know while writing it i was thinking about the greater universe of what's going on in the short film because it's um there's a lot of ambiguity to it like all of my stuff um and, and you know i was just figuring out the background of you know just because i don't say what's in it to the audience i should still know what everything means and what's going on behind the scenes of everything and i just really love this universe that that i that i created during it and then i i had been developing it ever since and then i made another short film sentinel which exists in that universe and then uh ballistic so all sort of adding more questions and answering very few about this <laughs> greater universe more giving a sense of what the universe is than than uh um actually answering any questions and it's one that i want to do more stuff in and eventually answer those questions in a much bigger way outside of a short film you're um, not gonna pull a lost and just be like fuck you we, we actually not gonna answer <laughs> anything and we're gonna just totally confuse you more uh hopefully not the the <laughs> the plan is and, and that's kind of a part of a part of it is like a, a little bit of you know i have to sort of accept the some of the critiques which i do understand criticism which i do understand um 
just com- and uh, like uh, questions completely unanswered. Although I do personally like that stuff. Um, it leaves it open to more interpretation to it, it's more fun to to. Well, what was this? What was that? Because the point of it is what's in front of you, not the questions that are unanswered. But uh, mm-hmm. it's kind of playing the long game a little bit, hoping that I can answer those questions in a much cooler way down the road. And then these still exist to kind of tie into it all, uh, which would be really cool. But we'll see. But that that's kind of the inception of it all. That's cool. That's really cool. And, and a very guess, wordy like, answer. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, for you know, you shed a lot of light on on a lot of this. I mean, yeah, I, I think it's great. And I guess like from the initial concept of what you had, like how much do you think it's changed, you know, to where it is now in terms of the script and the overall idea? Uh, from proximity, what I thought it was in proximity to now. Mm-hmm. Yep. it's it's definitely developed the the core idea has stayed the same but um everything's been refined around it for sure um really tying everything together uh a, a lot better than what the initial <laughs> conception was but you know the core the core idea of it and what exactly is happening and why hasn't really changed much um there's been little pieces of oh you know it's it's this instead of this but it's still the same idea just to really refine it so it's cool. it, it's pretty similar at its core. And I guess like what were some of the biggest challenges taking on a project like this? I mean, it's it's freaking epic. Um, so uh, you know, like were there any like big oh shit moments kind of leading up to it? All of them. <laughs> it's just everything. <laughs> Good. I um, mean, <laughs> Christopher McQuarrie on when you, uh, when you don't. yeah, Christopher McQuarrie on um, uh, Twitter. Somebody asked him what the hardest parts in creating a, a film like he just did was, and he said everything between the opening and end credits, and the opening and end <laughs> credits. And I was like, oh man, I relate to that so much. Um, it, it yeah, but that that's pretty much the answer. And it was just like time is like one of the biggest things because you know you're working on a low budget. And trying to do something that you needed like triple the money for so you know time is the thing that gets cut off the soonest um so trying to figure out how to accomplish the thing out things i was trying to accomplish which was just way over ambitious which i feel like i'm always doing um and uh and doing that in in much less time so you know it's having to stay very very flexible and and flipping things around on the fly to still land on that same intention but um you know, adjust what you're doing to make it actually doable. Otherwise we wouldn't have made our day any day. I'm <clears throat> in every project. And, you know, certainly this project, there comes a point where I'm just thinking there's, we're not finishing. There's no way we're finishing this. I'm just going to have a trailer at the end of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I always end up finishing because, you know, you just have to throw out the current plan. Cause yeah, there's no way we would have finished the plan that was in place. So I had to adjust the plan to, you know, suit what was possible in the day, uh, which is hard to really know until you get there and you're in it. Mm-hmm. No, that's crazy. I mean, yeah, yeah, I can't imagine how much work is involved, like doing something like this, especially independently. Um, I, I'm just kind of curious about, like, in terms of how long was pre production, production, and post, just like more average days for um, each part. Well, production's easy to remember. That was <clears throat> that was seven days total. That was four days in LA for all the daytime at more actiony bits, and then three days in Texas for the nighttime flashback memory, uh, you know, thrillery drama uh, pieces. Um, so seven days shooting and pre-production was probably. I don't I don't remember. I gave a number that I think was accurate because I went back and looked at when I started. Um, but I don't I don't really know because there was also like the holidays hit. Oh, you know, it was over Christmas and Thanksgiving. And so there was a lot of time not being spent on it. And uh, we had our Black Friday sale, which is a big thing for us. So so there was a <laughs> oh, bunch I was of you got to say the opposite. I was going to say that like and you had to go on Amazon and during Black Friday. And <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and that. Uh, so there was a lot of there was a lot of that that took also took me away from it um you know and film right and stuff so it's really hard to say how much time was actually there i would probably say um maybe six weeks pre-production uh that might not be a fully accurate number but you know around there around six weeks pre-production uh but still not straight and then seven days shooting and then uh we had several months i made sure to pad it nicely uh 
in post production. But it was weird because we shot in, I think it was January in LA. And then we had a couple of months in between to cut what we shot and then sort of prep for Texas. <clears throat> so that added a little bit of pre production there too, because Texas had its own like extra pre production. So it was probably an extra mm -hmm. like couple of weeks for pre production for that. And then the shooting there and then post production after that. So we had several months of post production, but I really need to like sit down and because I've been asked a few times and I'm this is always my answer of um <laughs> but it was the it, producer's it, question. Who's the producer? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh it was definitely the most pre production and post production and shooting days actually that I've had on um pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. No, I, I again like I thought it was pretty mind blowing. I thought it was funny that the you know, a huge portion of the film, all the action is like three days and then dialogue is you know, the area that obviously takes more um, just because you're trying to get all the right performances. And again, shooting uh, in the daytime, you're always having to fight um, the clock. But yeah, uh, whereas at least in the interior ones, you can kind of use artificial lighting for a majority of it. Um, yeah, totally. No, and I, that was tough fighting the clock, too, because we had Cambry, the child actor. She's 10. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, you have to go by the, the child work laws and everything. So you, you're working with uh, SAG and you're also working with the state. So she had a hard out of uh, like a certain period of time every single day that we could not go past. Uh, so mm. so that was pretty tough to like try to adhere to that as well, because she couldn't really be on set for that long. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, my my understanding, and whenever I've had shoots that have children, it's it's definitely you know obviously a lot of rules around it, a lot of handlers as well. So, um, but yeah, I mean she did great. Like uh, I I think that everyone in in the there wasn't exactly anyone that had like a you know a performance that didn't stand out. Like I think everyone did a really amazing job. Thanks, man. Yeah, I I looked out big time with this one. I I keep saying that I was an idiot and wrote uh, a very dramatic role for a ten year old, but then you know the movie god smiled on me and and I lucked out with Cameron because you know at 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 this very very low budget, completely outside of any sort of studio system, it's really hard to find actors, let alone a talented dramatic uh, child actor. <laughs> Yeah. So that was absolutely. that was definitely a dice roll. And just curious, like um, picking a shoot half and obviously you're in Texas, so it makes sense to, to shoot in Texas. But um, shooting California, was it specifically just for that location that you wanted to get? Uh, resources. So the the only reason that it was possible is because of uh, two two good friends of mine, uh, Omid Zader, who also played uh, the main villain in the, the mm -hmm. L.A. stuff. And uh, Josh Tessier, who are uh, Josh Tess uh, was my stunt coordinator. Um, and they just pulled together so many resources uh, to make all that stunt work and action possible without them. There, there's just no way I could have done it. That was one of the reasons I was able to do it for like a third or a fourth of the budget. He was telling me on set, he was like, Hey, just cause I think it's cool. Um, I was doing the numbers and the, <laughs> the stunts <laughs> and practical effects, uh, should cost us more than the entirety of the budget that we have. And I was like, well, thank you. Wow. <laughs> so it, it was, you know, going out there for them and them pulling all, cause they do some legit stuff out there and, uh, mm -hmm. they just have, a great network that they were able to pull together and, and make this happen. Like the guy that did the body that we blew up, uh, you know, was worked on what things like, about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he worked on stuff like Benjamin button. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, they, they're well connected and, uh, really one of the main factors that made all of this even possible at all. Yeah, no, I was kind of curious about that just because, um, yeah, I figured it would be more to do with resources because again, like being outside of the bubble, um is is great in a lot of ways but obviously you know when you want to have that well like be close to the well when you're thirsty and when you got a lot of the talent a lot of the equipment you know everything else all in you know certain cities then it makes sense to um go to them rather than them come to you yeah absolutely and you know it's it's all in you know vancouver and la and you know <laughs> so i mean there's definitely some stuff in texas but it's it's a whole lot easier to go to la and be like oh everything's right here within a 45 minute radius of each other is robert rodriguez in austin or, or whereabouts is, is yeah he based with he's in Dominica? austin mm -hmm. yeah I, I was i thought it was really cool that he was you know one of the first people to kind of build an independent studio outside of la and kind of 
yeah man that way that is awesome that's the dream right like that that would be amazing just to be completely independent on with a studio of that scale completely outside of hollywood yeah not I, paying I those california it's... prices <laughs> <laughs> i know right i was doing the math when i was doing my taxes this year and i'm like holy crap because like even i bought a, a a red weapon um end of last year and Ooh, la, la. Yeah, I re, I re, yeah i know right and i didn't even use it like what the hell um but um, but I, I thought it was kind of interesting because i originally got the invoice from them and um it was it was to my old address so i got like the taxes were about fifteen thousand dollars something like that and he's oh. like oh wait you're you're in portland and it's just like the price has dropped i'm like holy crap you know just instantly i'm just like man like you know i, I want to have an address out here for <laughs> for just purchasing stuff yeah it's, it's ridiculous yay portland um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's really cool and i, I guess um yeah I, I love the fact too that you know you because i watched the the making of um for at least the california shoot and i thought it was really interesting that you were able to tackle the really ambitious stuff like right off the, the, the bat just because um obviously you can start out broad and do all the bigger stuff and bit by bit get some more of an intimate crew over that time. And so the, the, the shorter stuff towards the end, you can kind of focus on with, without needing, um, you know, such a big overhead. So, I mean, I thought that's kind of interesting, like tackling the, the really ballsy stuff at the very beginning. And, um, that's usually, you might want to get your feet wet and get comfortable before doing, and just kind of going all out right at the start. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, um, ideal uh it was just by necessity you know it'd have been nicer to start like you said with something smaller and sort of you know get everybody jiving with each other and getting a nice like uh flow going and then get into like the the bigger stuff but we started with one of the most difficult shots in the entire short if not the most difficult shot in the entire short which is that opening shot around the car where there's just so much to be orchestrated all at once and uh again it was such low budget that we didn't have exactly the gear that we really wish we would have had to to make it even easier uh so you know we started with that and that that was tough and uh you know just putting all the stunt stuff up front so like you said we could on the fourth day strip down to a very small crew so it's not costing us like as much as it was costing us per day so it, it was mm. it was really birth from necessity and the fact that i wanted to be able to focus in on the performance pieces with hannah because i mean if that didn't ring true um if i couldn't really focus in on her and give her time to uh get to the places she needed to get to and and have as many takes as she wanted to have to really you know um you know go 1000 percent on each emotional moment then none of it would have made a difference everything would have fell flat and none of it would have worked so having that fourth day to really just focus in on hannah's performance was um was really nice too no it's cool and i get you know just on that subject like was there any concerns about the pacing not really working um or you know whether that was going to ever be a gamble between all the action and cutting to all the flashbacks oh man big time yeah <laughs> yeah because you pulled uh, it off like you know again like it's one of those things that you go right into it and it's not like you usually you would have at least some moment to kind of get them to care about the 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 character and the the talent but in this case um you know you go right into it but it, it works like it, you're you're totally in it and you're you're learning about her as you're, she's getting her ass kicked all around the the, the place so i mean totally. yeah it, yeah it totally pulled it off yeah i mean the idea was like to to use the the memories and the little girl and all that to really attach yourself to the character in the future even and to give a little hint of why she has this drive to survive and all that and hopefully attach you to her but also hannah i think has this immediate likability to her the second you see her it's kind of like I, I like you I want you to do well. <laughs> so that, mm -hmm. that definitely was helpful. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the pacing between the two was always uh, a concern just because it was smashing two very different things together. And I, I just did mm -hmm. not know if it was going to work, uh, which I liked. I mean, I really like using short films as experiments and being like, Hey, this might not work. Let's give it a shot. Uh, I think that's, it's, it's a great learning ground with, uh, with a decent safety net. You're not talking about a feature with millions and millions of dollars that if it tanks, you might be ruining your career. Like <laughs> if, if it sucked, it would have been like, dang it. All right, let's, let's do another one. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice playing ground to, to do things, but it's still, you know, very nerve wracking. Cause obviously I don't want to make something that sucks. So, and then you're wasting all these people's time, um, that worked on it. So, you know, I was writing it and I dug it and it's, 
with something like this, it just got to the place where it's like, you know, I see the movie in my head and I think it's really cool. I just need to trust that because, uh, you know, it's like we were saying before, it's I've I've failed a ton of times to learn enough now to where I'm confident with the experience that I have to be like, this is going to work probably. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's like, I think it's cool. Let's do it. You know, and I had to kind of just uh, try to be confident in that and uh, and trust that. And and it worked out. I in the end, it, it worked out. It was definitely you know a lot of finessing, which I knew it was going to be in post. A lot of massaging to make that sort of tempo work. Like the first bedroom scene was a, a, initially not as like infused with that sort of motion that it's infused with now. Uh, it was a little mm -hmm. bit longer, and we cut up the dialogue a little bit uh, because I found that it needed that first flashback needed a little more movement to to work you into the next one, to prepare you for the next one, to allow me to be able to stop on the next one and just give you that bit. Um, because without it just slamming you right into that, okay, now we're going to stop and have a drama thriller happen. That felt a little too much like a brick wall. So uh, we ended up adding a bit of a tempo there um, that kind of prepped you for the next one. So when the next one happened, it's like, you get it. We're going to flash back to this other slower thing and you're ready for it and it, and and then it worked. So that that was an interesting uh thing that I definitely learned while in post production on this. That's really cool. That's great. And I guess with uh all the practical stuff that you're doing this time around is this the most that you've used practical effects in any of your shoots so far? Oh yeah. It's, you know, usually there's very few practical effects in in my shoots just because of resources. You don't have the time. It's really difficult to do stuff in production when you have a bunch of people there and time costs a whole lot of money. In post production, time usually doesn't cost me any money cuz either I could do it or, you know, I have people working for me that can do it so we could spend a week on it and, you know, not really spend any extra money. But in post uh, but in production, you know, if we're spending an extra hour, we're spending a bunch of money. So so <laughs> it's really hard to do that sort of stuff that takes a lot of time to set up and and plus safety is an issue so you have to have all the extra people on there like the fire department and the medics and uh you know this the full stunt team and everybody there making sure that you know everybody's staying very safe because that's paramount for me like at the end of the day this is a short film or even if it was a feature it's a movie like i don't want anyone yeah. to ever get hurt for a friggin movie like who who cares in in relation to <laughs> someone's well-being who cares so Absolutely. um i'm you know i'm always m making sure that you know we're taking our time and everything's safe and if every anything i'm always saying you can hear it in the bts like uh in the 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 pack that we saw with like the five hour like behind the scenes stuff I'm talking to my stunt coordinator and be like if it's safe at all we just won't do it you know, or not safe at all mm -hmm. we just won't do it like I'll, I'll think of something else like there's 10 ways to do this one thing if nine of them are unsafe let's not do any of those let's do that one um so that adds a lot of time to it when you're doing stunts and practical effects uh so yeah so this, this was definitely the first time that we were able to to kind of slow down and take the time to to pull that stuff off which is why we needed those ex extra days uh because mm -hmm. that stuff takes so long but dude the the team on this the sun team and josh uh i can't believe how fast they move uh while staying safe while being proficient while making this stuff work 100 percent, they got so many gags done in one day it, it, it was really impressive to watch that's really cool that's awesome and yeah like I, I hate to say it but like that that is one thing when i see you know as soon as i start watching the film and there's a lot of practical effects going on it's just like Oh man, like you must have got all the permits and you know yeah. the fire department, like you know paramedics like right behind. So because again, like whenever I think short films, usually I'm I'm thinking, you know, you you want to try and bend the rules as much as you can, but you know there's certain things that as soon as they're introduced, it's like yeah, there's no rule bending because um, you know you've you've got safety as a as a huge part of it. So. Um, yeah, yeah, and really I cool. had a great producing team on this with uh, Moses Israel and Daniel Malik and Josh Tessier and Omid Zader and uh, my brother Tim Connolly. Uh, all of them were handling all of that. Uh, so, you know, I didn't really have to because I produce all my stuff too. My brother Tim is always producing with me as well, but I'm usually way more involved in the producing. Whereas this one, I was able to, once it got to a point, I just completely took off my producer hat and went 100% mm. director. So, I didn't have to worry or think about any of that stuff on this one, which was really nice because it just freed me up to fully just be focusing in on, you know, telling the story and uh, crafting the experience as best as I possibly could. 
I'd, I'd love if you did make an actual hat that said 100% director. So it's kind of like you're, you're, you're going to beast mode right now. <laughs> 100% directing mode. <laughs> the hat's going on. Yeah. Um, no, that's cool. Like, what was it like? I mean, like you were saying 85 people, um, you know, typically on, on location, at least at that, uh, those first couple of days. I mean, again, I'm, I'm always curious about this because it is one of those, like, you know, are you going to shit yourself moments of like, you've got so many people that you've got to command. Um, like, did you have a really good AD, like first AD that was running around helping out, uh, wrangling everyone? Or? Yeah, in LA, my uh, my DP Chuck was incredible. I I loved him. He was he was he was so great. Um, we we didn't have a lot of time to like chat and get to know each other before time. You know the nature of low budget. We had a few phone calls and stuff, but you know he had never worked with me before or anything like that. And he so quickly adapted to the type of filmmaker I was, I was just so impressed. He knew exactly when to jump in and start pushing. He knew exactly when to back off and just let me do what I was doing. Um, it's such an amazing attitude, which is like, that's my thing. Like, you know, it, we're, things are stressful. Things are going wrong. There's no reason for us to have, you know, a bad attitude on top of it, to mm -hmm. be snippy with anyone. And he kept, at, kept everything with such a, a wonderful like inclusive attitude, collaborative, encouraging. Um, I couldn't say enough nice things about him. He was, he was incredible. Couldn't have done it without him for sure. So he was amazing. Um, and uh, uh, I got off on a <laughs> gushing about Chuck bit. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just saying like, uh, it was a pretty overwhelming wrangling. Oh, let's yes. Say 85 right. people. Uh, well, you know, Chuck and my producers made that a lot easier. And um, one thing that I learned is, you know, you don't wrangle them uh you have keys of departments and then they handle mm -hmm. their people not you so if i have my stunt team doing stuff and i want changes i don't go to each individual stunt guy sometimes i will sometimes i'll go up and be like hey do this a little bit different usually i'll just go to josh my stunt coordinator and say hey i would rather this be happening and then he directs that like the, those finite details um you know if, if i had a lot of background i would tell chuck what i want the background to be doing and he would go off and and make sure they're doing that i wouldn't be handling all so you know you have the the keys and then you deal with them and you, that's 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 the main difficulty is conveying your vision precisely and giving everybody on board and understanding exactly what you're trying to orchestrate and uh you're getting the right people who can see uh through your goggles you know um uh, mm -hmm. well and that 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 can be uh difficult at times but uh you adapt pretty well and then you get a shorthand and everything starts moving really quickly because then they're like okay i get i get what i get what he wants i you know they start figuring me out figuring out you know how i phrase things and then things start really moving fast um so there's you know i didn't find it too difficult i actually found it kind of amazing because it was like often things were there before i was even ready to ask for them like i was like you know i kind of want fire over here and then all of a sudden people are doing fire and i'm like well that was quick <laughs> you know <laughs> or it would be nice if this was happening and somebody's walking in with it and i was like oh i was about to ask for that actually and then, and then you know they're just like yeah i thought you might and it's like well that's freaking great um you know before time before getting on set it was horrifying so nerve-wracking um because you know you're, you're thinking it's just 85 people waiting for you to get on set and be right is what i keep saying um mm. so that's super that was super scary um and i i don't see it ever not being because for me it's just it's a heavy weight of i don't want to waste their time i i I want this to be worth it for them, you know, cause you know, filmmaking's hard, man. You, you show up you know, way earlier than you want to. And then you're on your feet all day long, hustling like crazy. And then you just keep doing that over and over again. Um, so it's like, you know, I, I want this to be worth everybody's time. So that, that pressure definitely weighs on me a bit, but the second cameras are up and I'm behind a monitor. I don't think about any of that. It's, it's just what's going on in my scene. And I start getting tunnel vision, um, which mm -hmm. is when I really, appreciate my crew and the keys who are just there um you know helping me in the trenches make it all happen that's so cool um and yeah we'll get into like i want to talk uh definitely about equipment in a minute too but um i was curious like i would noticed that again watching the, the making of that you're talking about how at least in the california shoot you had up to seven cameras uh, i guess most of them would be c200s um most of the time so i mean how much of that was second unit and how much of that was you 
primarily trying to place the cameras yourself? Uh, none of it was second unit. It was all uh, a unit. Um, uh, that was just, you know, with with all the uh, stunts and everything, we just needed to be able to get all the coverage in one go and move on. So I just got as many cameras as I possibly could. I probably only needed like five, but I was just nervous. <laughs> so I was like, you know, let's just get a couple more. And one of them was like a phantom camera, which we only used uh, for that one shot. The explosion. Uh, yeah. So it was yeah. it was just that very specific. I knew I wanted to like slow the action down for a second before slamming back into it. So it was a very specific like we're just using it for this and then we don't need it again. <clears throat> Yeah, when when you mentioned C two hundred as a, I was kind of curious about. It. I was like, C two hundred can do that big a frame rate. So okay, that explains. Yeah, no. <laughs> and then second unit happened um, a little bit here and there. Mostly it was in Texas, uh, in LA. Mm -hmm. I only set which Josh, uh, uh, who does film right with me, he was my second unit director on this. And the only uh, bit in LA that second unit did was um, filming the 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 two baddies running after Hannah after that main action sequence before mm -hmm. uh the one dude blows up uh so their their side of the running was um second unit but everything else was uh first unit so we just just had as many cameras as we could to place them so you know we could do something one time and then just move on because you know as as few times as i have to ask a stunt performer to do something that hurts like hell i prefer <laughs> <laughs> um no that's, that's cool like that's really cool and I, I guess like for me some of the big questions that um i have is like overall in the production like what were some of the things that went wrong that you learned a lot from because like, i'll just say that for me like whenever i go to talk i go to a lecture or anything like that like most of the time the most valuable thing that i can you know i can ever get is when people start talking about the shit that went wrong and and uh you know the the big aha that they get from it which um you know for you is like the the gold that um you're able to pull away from it so yeah i was just kind of curious like what um some of the big takeaways you had about like okay yeah this this happened and we had to then kind of adjust and our plan and, and do it differently or, or what was it i don't think anything like major went wrong it's but everything went wrong you know what i mean it's like <laughs> um we can't do the shot like i thought so now we have to adjust on the fly. Um, you know, we lo we we lo we did a location scout and which turned into a tech scout. And I'm like, okay, this is where like the opening shot. This is where the opening shot's going to happen, and then it's going to flip, and uh, you know, it's going to do this. And it's like, well, we can't we can't flip the car because this is the car we were able to get. And if we flip the car, it might completely crush the top, and there's no way in hell a person would a survive it and b be able to get out of the trunk and i'm like okay so we're not flipping the car now <laughs> and then we get there and it's oh we can't put the ramp that will actually launch the car um where we plan to do the whole sequence because as it turns out city came in to to check everything before we drilled the holes for the ramp and there's water piping and electrical over here so we can't put it over there because you know we have to like dig into the ground to actually bolt this thing to the ground it's like okay well i guess we'll put it over here now and uh, we have to do the opening shot which is this long tracking shot that goes around it and where we can do it is not a long stretch of road so we cannot do the tracking shot on that actual stretch of road so now okay well what if we cheat it and we do it on this stretch of road and then we'll just tie the two together with a cut and and motion and no one will ever know okay that's okay fine we'll do it that way and and, and then that works and the great and uh when the car landed it didn't keep going it, it launched and it just slammed to the ground and it's like well crap well we can't do it again and it didn't keep going and it's supposed to go off to the side and it's like okay that's fine what i'll do is i'll slam to title at that moment <laughs> you know so don't worry about it we're fine we don't need to worry about that and then we'll cut back into it so it's like everything is constantly going wrong in these small ways and and you just have to be able to adjust continue mm -hmm. literally every scene borderline every setup there's something where it's like hey you can't actually the whole shot the whole scene was like constructed on this side of the line because of these reasons but we have to have the crane that's pulling the guys into the air on this side um and their shadows and stuff so we actually have to shoot on this side now and now you have to okay well let me reconstruct the entire scene in my head now now that we have to completely flip the line so it's constantly stuff like that in 
every single scene without fail in LA um, just because there's so many moving parts and there was such little pre-production um, because of the nature of this thing and and so many complex uh, sequences to piece together with stunts and practical effects and whatnot that you just have to stay fluid. Um, and that's why I'm always talking about knowing the intention, knowing the whys of everything that you're putting together. So that way when people do say, hey, we can't do that, because of x y or z i could be like okay well how about this can we do this yes all right we'll do that instead that all accomplish the same intention um that's cool so so it's really just all that stuff and and that stuff has just been um just a factor of experience like even sentinel i used as like sort of um I like to practice, you know, everything going wrong. And Sentinel was just a handful of people in the middle of nowhere that we shot it for sandwiches. I just bought sandwiches for everybody. <laughs> that was the budget. <laughs> and um, I just didn't prep anything. I, I hardly even wrote a script. It was just very much making it up as I went along as sort of practice, you know, because that's what happens. You know, you get on set and nothing works. It's just the nature of you know, my experience anyway and you have to be able to just make it up as you go that's why i'm always telling people like make something and then make something else and then make something else and then make something else because the more stuff you make the more you're filling out that toolbox uh of ideas to be able to ebb and flow and just you know shift gears on the fly so quickly without you know a full panic i mean sometimes there's a little bit of panic internal panic but you don't let anybody else know <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like okay you suck it up and then you just keep going so when you swap it out, it's like 99% director hat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 50% director, 50% breaking down completely. <laughs> um, so overall, like, uh, when it comes to equipment, like uh, what kind of gear were you shooting on? Uh, we shot with the, the C200, the Canon C200, because I, I had reviewed it like, I don't know, like two months pre prior to like talking to Canon, maybe, maybe less. And I really dug it. So, I, you know, I, I told them, I'm like, hey, man, I'd, I'd be down to shoot this short film that I'm doing on the C200 if you're in. And then they were cool enough to uh, come in and collaborate with us. And they hooked us up with some cameras and helped a little bit with the budget, um, which is how I, I do budgets. I go to companies that it's like, hey, I'm using this either way. Would you be down mm -hmm. to help make it as good as it possibly can be? <laughs> and, uh, and you know, a lot of people come in and they're like, yeah, let's do it. And then other people are like, no. And I still use use the gear and show it on the show anyway. And then people tell me that, oh, you're only saying that because you got budget. And it's like, well, no, they didn't want to be a part of this one, actually. It's just what I actually use. Um, uh, but, yeah, so we shot on the C200. Uh, I just thought it would be really cool to just do – the thing that is the biggest thing we've ever done on a camera that's, you know, sub $10,000. I think it's like a $7,500 camera. Um, Good and, gorilla style. Yeah. Instead of doing like an Alexa, because it just fit like, you know, it's like what I'm always preaching that, you know, you don't need an Alexa. Um, and so I was like, you know, let's just do that. Let's just do it. And uh, and it worked out. It's it's, a, it's an impressive camera for, for its price. It's pretty crazy. Uh, and then we shot on the SLR anamorphic lenses. Uh, I own them, so I shot on those. Uh, and I, I really dig those lenses. They have so much character. That's one of the things I like about anamorphic lenses is they have so many imperfections and i really dig that especially for a lot of the stories i like to tell where it's just an imperfect world with imperfect people and i like to kind of visually convey that as well um mm. uh but th th those are the main bits of pieces that gave us our look uh during production i shot on a dolly for the first time as far as on my own stuff i mean i've shot on dollies plenty of times with other stuff that i wasn't personally directing but uh finally had budget enough to bring in a dolly which was nice because <laughs> that's just like a totally different it almost didn't happen but i was just like because we were completely out of budget and i'm like whatever i'll just pay for it myself let's bring it in because me and my dp chase really want it because it just has a very different feel to it um like a gimbal you have kind of this rocky boat feel which is great for certain things but not what we were trying to do in texas like i really wanted a stillness to everything but with that motion still um in there like a very godlike view um mm. without you know f sensing the the operator at moments um and then moments it went out out but uh uh, yeah, so Dolly was very important for that. Then we had a, we did have a Movi that we used quite a bit in um, LA and for a few, uh, I think actually only one time in Texas when they're coming. Oh, it's a shot we never even used. It was a, a POV coming down the stairs 
like when in in that uh that section where right. her and her daughter are coming down we had like this pov just like their viewpoint looking down the stairs as they came down but then we just didn't need it um and i didn't really like breaking out of that uh that 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 single shot that we had going uh but that those were like the main things that got us our visual that's cool and yeah i guess like uh you know, especially California, like the whole action sequence, like you want it to be more gritty anyways, to kind of run and gun and oh, yeah. give it that sort of feel. So, you know, it's only going to be certain specific shots that you you want that perfection. But um, that's cool. And yeah, I was curious about like uh, with lenses, like are you typically just shooting everything anamorphic or are there certain lenses you're picking for specific shots based on those characteristics or just kind of typically using, um, you know, what you've got at your disposal? Uh, yeah, we shot the majority was shot on anamorphic uh, with a few specials shot on spherical. We had like, like for instance, we had the Canon um, 30 to 300. And uh, that was like for stuff like the close up of the eye or, you know, if we ever needed to get really close or needed to be at a distance and zoom in <laughs> uh, like with a lot of the stunt stuff, like the car blowing up and things like that. When there was like all hands on deck, we usually had a few spherical lenses um, flying in there. So there's a handful of shots in uh, both L.A. and Texas, I believe. I think Texas had one or two um, where we jumped. on. Actually, I don't think Texas had any, um, but in L.A. we definitely did uh, where we jumped on spherical just for uh, a few specific reasons. But the majority was shot on those uh, anamorphic lenses. Usually, I, I think we lived on like a 50 most of the time, but we also uh, hopped to a 75 a few times. And I think we only used the 35 on maybe like three or four shots. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's awesome. Um, and I guess like, what were your takes on using the C200? Like, were there any setbacks to it or overall like do you think that that's kind of a, a good solid underdog camera that you could you know use for future productions yeah i mean there's definitely set there's setbacks to every camera even like the alexa has like things you need to work around and this is a sub ten thousand dollar camera which means there's a lot more setbacks mm. than you know what you would get with something like an alexa but it's always even when shooting on an iphone i mean i wouldn't want to shoot a long format thing on an iphone but <laughs> even when shooting on an iphone is like as long as you know the issues that the camera has you can work with them like how best to expose it and whatnot which is you know that's all chase's world and and handling that but there you know there was some issues with doing multi-camera and being able to jam time code to all of them uh certain things like that which the you know it's not really built for what we were using it for it's more of that run and gun sort of thing so like sentinel it would have been absolutely perfect for um but, you know, it, it performed extremely well for, for the price. So for run and gun, yeah, I think it's fantastic, um, especially with the in-camera uh, raw. Uh, that's just so helpful to not have to have, like, these external recorders to record raw, just having that right in there, uh, like you get from an Alexa or something. Like that. I, w I wish it would have had just, like, ProRes, so we wouldn't have had to gone raw um, to help with, you know, having to transcode everything and all that. But... Um, but yeah, man, I mean, it definitely had drawbacks. I'm sure if I talked to Chase, I could be reminded of them, but I don't really remember <laughs> what they are. But you I suppressed them. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Job's done. It's time to bury it all. Totally. <laughs> totally. Just throw it all out. But I mean, overall, I thought the camera was excellent. Um, and I mean, not because they were a part of it, obviously. I mean, it's afterwards. I could say whatever I want. But I, I chose <laughs> to shoot with it because I reviewed it and, and really liked working with it. Um, so yeah, it had tons of issues, but, uh, end of the day, it, it really did a great job for us. Mm -hmm. That's great, man. That's really cool. And I guess like kind of shifting more towards, uh, post, but, um, what were some of the decisions to go, uh, digital opposed to practical for some of the effects and like what effects were digital? I did absolutely everything I possibly could practically, um, in Texas, we didn't have the budget or crew to do practical, so nothing in Texas is practical. Um, and I mean, you know, a plane flying through the sky, sky wouldn't really be possible on our budget. <laughs> uh, uh, so all of that, every every effect in in Texas is a, a visual effect. Um, in LA, it was just the things that we couldn't do uh, or enhancements, like uh, the explosion wasn't quite big enough, so we enhanced that, or you know, the the fire didn't engulf him enough because of the wind, so we enhanced that. Um, or, you know, the obvious stuff like her pupil dilating, the device, everything else was, I think there's one explosion 
That yeah, the the one where she throws up the grenade uh, quickly in the air. I'm guessing. Oh, two explosions. <laughs> you, you're, you've reminded me. So there's uh, that only one. because it's so close to her. That's just like yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not only that, but um, uh, we wouldn't have. We talked about doing it, but we would have had to get a crane and then suspend the explosion from the air with the wire, and it would have taken like five times, uh, uh, the amount of time that we had to to pull off the shot. So it was just like let's just I'll just do it in post. Just forget it. Uh, I wish we could have done it practically. But, um, you know, I had the video co-pilots on my side. So uh, the video co-pilots, the video co-pilot guys <laughs> on my side. So, of course, they they nailed it and looked great. And then um, the the explosion where the guy jumps up on the car and she shoots his ankle and he falls and then explodes. That was a visual effect as well. Uh, again, for time reasons, we had the explosions and everything, but we didn't have the time. We had to we had to move. So it was just a matter of like, don't worry about it. I'll I'll, I'll just have to do that one later. Mm hmm. Cool. No, like, uh, again, like I, I think that it really um, works towards like giving it the whole grittiness. Like everything, in this case, being practical, it just ties it all in together, and you you get the imperfections with the perfections, and that's all like what what really kind of makes it. So yeah, I think it's so cool. Yeah, totally. And and um, when you have to enhance that stuff, it's so much better because there's something there to, I mean, you know, to enhance. So it's like you have the reference sitting right there. You just have to match it. So it, the visual effects become 10 times better because it's just adding on to something that already exists. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's it too. It's just like, I, I love those projects where it's just like things are shot so beautifully. It's just like, oh man, this is going to be a dream just because you've already got so much content to just kind of add, uh, add to rather than starting from, from nothing and being like, all right, I got to, or, or worse, having it, you know, be something that you got to fix up. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, the whole thing looked beautiful. I love it. I, Thanks, did man. you guys shoot underexposed or how do you guys approach it? I mean, obviously you're shooting raw, which is great, but uh, I'm always worried about like California, harsh sunlight and, and shooting where you're going to get like blowouts or, you know, areas that aren't as, you know, as much range in it. But for you, like, was there any tricks like that that you were doing constantly? Uh, that was all chase. I didn't really, um, you know, think about or focus on uh, the settings and how he was like exposing and all that. Um, but, uh, he pretty much just, I, I'm pretty positive. He uh, exposed everything to be as close as the final look that he wanted as possible. So it wasn't as, it wasn't like, you know, setting everything. So in post we'll do X, it was trying to get that look in camera. And, um, mm -hmm. the C200 has like really solid, shockingly solid, uh, highlight protection. So we were able to, even when things were like, man, that, that sky's really hot, we could look at the the you know the histogram and we're like oh no everything's in we're good and then later in post cool. we were able to bring it right back um, but we wanted it to feel hot we wanted it to feel harsh so even when you watch in YouTube you can't see it as much but if you go and watch it on Vimeo there's detail in the sky but only a little bit we wanted it to feel you know we didn't want it to feel cheap and digital um, the negative version of digital obviously um, but we did want it to feel like you know that harsh hot day feel desert feel mm -hmm. cool well, that's great and just a couple more questions but um i guess like what would you have done differently now looking back at it or is it pretty much exactly like you know has there been anything that in hindsight you're looking back and saying hey you know these are the things i wish i could have um done differently um i mean you know uh if i got picky and and did look back i'd say probably everything <laughs> you know because every project i do i i learn everything um it's a film school every single time i step behind a monitor or a camera um and uh, you know i i'm still trying to figure all this out just like everyone else and uh so it's like it's always this huge learning experience that i'm I'm taking and being like, okay, well, next time I won't do X or Y or Z or, you know, I would definitely this next time around, I would have the experience of, of working with an 85 person crew and understanding what, uh, what I can and can't ask for right up front instead of, you know, figuring out in the trenches. Um, so that, you know, it'd be a lot easier for sure. in in, in that respect, but it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to even say so much because, you know, it's like I said before, nothing's going right. And you're just kind of adjusting as you go. Um, so it's like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, but you know, everything, um, definitely, you know, working with the actors, I, I learned a ton on this one and, you know, there, there's one scene in particular where I was watching it and I was like, oh, I wish I would have said this, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, 
is just, you know, instead of uh, there, there was one moment where we got it, but it, it took a little longer to get than than um, than it probably should have. And it was just I think it was it was me conveying what I wanted, where really I just should have said, like, the way you say this line is to shock that person into action. You know what I mean? Like when you deliver this line, just try to to jar them. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and that would have caused them to like push that line out in a very specific way. So it's things like that. Just looking back in hindsight of w how I could have helped my actors a little differently here and there. Um, this, this is some of the most dramatic uh, material that I've directed as far as performance goes. Um, some of the most dialogue, I think the most dialogue I've ever directed. Uh, usually there's not much dialogue in my stuff. <clears throat> so there was a lot of learning. Um, with that for sure. And I love actors. I love working with actors. So, you know, after every project, I'm usually acting, asking a few of them like, you know, Hey, lay it on me. What do you think? What, mm -hmm. what do we do ne different next time? You know, did, what, what did I give you that you needed? What didn't I give you that you needed? Um, just so next time I can be that much more of, you know, a person in their corner, um, having their back and helping them, you know, do what they're there to do. Uh, so there was definitely a lot of learning, um, in in that area and uh you know i i learned a lot about pushing the crew forward um about uh you know utilizing the time best possible way you know you have this huge crew and and you have all these people and it's like okay my job is just to say now we're doing this and everybody else's job is to um to make sure we're moving fast where no that's kind of my job too <laughs> so i figured that out about halfway through the la stuff and i i was i never sat down like if people were working i was working you know whether i'm working on the shots right. that are coming i'm usually standing in the middle of everything and everybody working and constantly asking you know where are we at how much longer five minutes can you do it in four you know, and, and just being somebody that's helping, you know, keep the energy up and drive everything forward and not just thinking about the, 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 the story and the scene, but also the fact that I am helping this machine turn. That was definitely something that I learned that I'll that I'm that I took into Texas and then I'll definitely be taking into the next one for sure. That's really cool, man. Uh, that's great. And I'm just curious about uh, film circuits. Like, do you do the, the typical circuits when you put out a film or, or you just go straight online? No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I lucked out with an audience, you know, um, f film festivals are great. I have done them in the past, but it's, you know, not really the path that I'm on or, or, or what I, what I do. I mean, sometimes, uh, they'll hit me up and request and I'm like, yeah, absolutely. That'd, that'd be awesome. Mm. Um, I'm always down for that, but I don't really go out of my way to do them. Um, because again, I just, really lucky to have like people to release it too. So whenever I make a short film, I'm making it for, you know, the people uh, that watch our stuff and dig our stuff. And then, you know, hopefully it goes bigger than that, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, yeah. and, you know, um, festivals are great, but the most uh, attention I've ever gotten from studios and producers is by putting stuff online and then uh you know people see it blogs post it and then you know hopefully the right people find it and then want to talk to you and i've never ever once um had something like that from a festival uh uh obviously i haven't been to the right festivals <laughs> i've been to <laughs> i've been to much smaller festivals really cool it's great to especially to watch your stuff with a live audience coolest thing in the world um i would definitely love to do that uh it's terrifying and awesome um but as mm -hmm. as far as like just putting it out to the widest audience possible um and you know trying to get the attention to go on to do something bigger uh i've found that you know just putting it online is it works best for me personally though yeah, though I again i i do love festivals yeah no absolutely i mean um but that that's kind of the interesting thing i think in like 2018 where you know there there's such a bigger audience online than you're ever going to get at an, at a festival especially film riot having you know over a million um subscribers like you've got your own you've got a much bigger reach there than you could going out to a traditional festival especially with 
a lot of the rules that a lot of them you know put out that like you've got to submit it to our thing first and no one else can see it until x date yeah um, after that, that that's one of the big you know. things that turns me off to it where it's like no <laughs> i because i i didn't make it to be judged by you know a committee i made it to put out to an audience and and let them judge it and you know i i just want to make stuff that entertains people you know like that's the filmmaker i am i you know i definitely want to tell uh you know give a message and and have my opinion in there and and my viewpoints and ballistic definitely has that in there it's it's not it's not yelling it it's whispering it for sure which is a little more my style as well but um you know i want to give an audience an experience um so but again i'm i'm incredibly lucky and it's not lost on me how lucky i am um with film riot and being able to put my stuff out to an audience uh but uh, yeah that's that that's definitely what's been working best for me that's great it's really cool and i guess like one of my last questions would be more about marketing like did you have a marketing campaign in place for this or is it more just put it up there you know put up a trailer initially to get some anticipation and kind of let it organically evolve from there we didn't really have a marketing budget <laughs> so it i was yeah we kind of did it uh ourselves and um we had a couple of friends that were helping us out and giving us some advice on like hey try this or that and but uh i just hit up a bunch of people uh that you know had either dug my stuff in the past or i just really loved their stuff like a writer from sci-fi uh i just really like his writing um i read a lot of his uh his articles and stuff so uh i just i hit him up on twitter and i'm like hey i'd love love for you to check this out you know if you dig it uh it'd be you know obviously it would be great for an article but really i just want to know your opinion which is true i mean obviously it would be awesome to have an article but i just love because he wrote about sentinel and i i loved his views on it like he really got what i was trying to do with it and i thought that was just great to to hear so i just really wanted to hear what he thought about this one and and, and if he got what i was doing and you know because it's great that to hear that that somebody really gets what you were trying to do especially when you're doing it somewhat cryptically um mm -hmm. so i i truly just wanted his opinion and you know if an article came of it you know that's just icing on the cake that i do backflips over and thankfully he really dug it and he actually did an article of it which i was really surprised that he did because you know he was like hey yeah i'm down to watch it but no promises on an article and i'm like no, no no i totally get that and i get that this seems like i'm just trying to get you to write an article i really want your opinion um and then he did he wrote an article and i was like dude yes that's great um and then we got a couple others uh i just sent it around to a bunch of people like Hey, love for you to check this out if you want to write about it. Cool. If not, I'd love to just hear what you think. Um, and I uh, got a couple of articles out of, out of that, which is, you know, usually when that that's the stuff that gets people contacting you, um, just putting stuff online. Uh, I just talked about this recently in a podcast. Just putting stuff online isn't uh, what gets people to contact me regardless of views. So I have Ghost House, which has like, I think it has 2 million mm -hmm. views now. I'm, I'm not really sure. It's one of my other short films that I like two years ago. And I got, um, I got a few people contacting me off of that one, but it was right up front before it ever even had like 200,000 views. And then after that, it, you know, it went viral and it, it got to 2 million really quickly. And I never heard a peep from anyone. Um, uh, wow. so it, every time that I've been contacted, it's always been based off the fact that something was posted somewhere. Like I got some people contacting me from Sentinel because a few articles were written on it. And that was before I think it hit a hundred thousand views. Uh, so it's, it's never been about the views. It's been about, you know, just people being able to find it. Yeah. That's great. That's really cool. Um, and again, the fact that you have an audience is huge i mean in a way like they're they're very lucky that you have built a platform that you can share a lot of the, inf the information you're you're doing and as you're growing as well but at the same time it's, it's great that it means that you know you can put it out there and have um a lot of people kind of um come across it and share it if they see you know deem fit so yeah that's cool yeah and on top of that i mean we're we're um talking the negative side of it a little bit earlier but you know a positive side of it is there's a big audience there to give a reaction to get the reaction from the good and the bad um you know as long as it's subjective i bring on the bad because i want to know how you felt about it what you did like what didn't work you know some people being like i really love this but the story didn't work for me it's like okay why why you know and just curious to find that out and you know is it something that i could have done better or is this just didn't work for you like having that audience there to get that feedback from um 
is is really how i mean obviously you got to be cautious too because you don't want to make films that people just want you to make you want to make the films that you want to make and that are your voice so that that's a hard thing to protect and also utilize the feedback to learn and grow um but man it's it's been it's been wonderful to have that audience to be able to to go to and and get that feedback and and help me grow and learn that's great and you could tell Michael Bay that about making films for, <laughs> for themselves rather than yeah. <laughs> you want explosions? You got you got them. <laughs> uh, by the way, I loved uh, Ghost House. Like I love the ending. Uh, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> I just made the whole thing. So yeah, um, cool. And like, what's next, man? Because um, obviously you've done this, and I think that in a lot of ways, like you know, you've been putting out such a huge series of great film after film after film. I feel like this one, in a way, is kind of you know taking everything that you've learned so far and kind of pushing it even further so i mean for you like what's come from it so far that you can talk about and also like what is next uh nothing's come that i could talk about but there's definitely some stuff that i'm working on and i'm hoping this was my last short film that uh, after this it's uh, feature time that's really what i'm working toward now i'm developing a few things so we'll see what happens and uh, you know it, best case scenario is a feature is next and i'm able to bring film riot along for the ride and just because i would just love to be completely honest about the the process and you know sh <laughs> let people see me sweating bullets because i just wish something like that existed for me when i was younger and i mean right now i wish something existed like that you know because i haven't done a feature yet so having something where somebody's putting out that much honesty about the process would be so amazing to be able to get mm. that heads up before you jump into doing it um but obviously it's a tricky thing to navigate because there's tons of people involved and a lot of politics involved. So it's, you know, who knows, but, uh, you know, that's what I'm hoping is next. That's what I'm working toward. And then just film right as a whole. Now that ballistic is over, we're getting back into the swing of things. We're getting back into uh, doing some VFX and techniques and DIY stuff. And just a lot of really cool stuff, taking film right up to, uh, um, a better, another level, uh, you know, overall ballistic being a part of that, uh, really, because we've been able to give some of the best, my favorite behind the scenes that we've been able to do so far, just because of the scale of it. And, you know, it's hard to get that type of stuff online because the type of budgets that go into place and then people usually don't want to show behind the scenes that much, um, to that extent in depth, which is totally understandable. Um, but yeah, just more of that and, uh, uh, more of like, uh, a uh, heightened version of old school <laughs> film ride as well. Mm -hmm. That's great, man. That's so cool. Well, again, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. I think this has been so great to get some insight into ballistic and your filmmaking process as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Cool, man. And yeah, we'll wrap it there. But uh, that that's awesome, man. Like, um, I think it's been really fun to kind of jump into it all and and get some insights. So, yeah, dude. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Okay, I want to thank Ryan for taking the time out to chat. This is a lot of fun chatting in this episode about all the good stuff to do with Ballistic. If you haven't seen the short film, go to the show notes, alanmckay.com slash 153. As well as uh, there, you can check out the show notes, key quotes, key insights, all the things that we shared throughout this episode, as well as a link to the Ultimate Demo Reel book, if you want to check that out too. I just kind of held on book for a second because I have it as the Ultimate Demo Reel Guide, but it is a book and you can check it out. I'm actually holding it in my hands right now. So that being said, I'll be back next episode doing a Q&A of sorts. It's a bit of tough love in this one and uh, I think it's going to be really interesting um, just because I wanted to do a bit of Q&A with people, but I wanted to also kind of like cut through the bullshit and really get to the core of a lot of the things that people say. So um you know, rather than the surface level answers that people say, like, oh, I, I wish I was successful, but I don't have enough time. That's where I lay the hammer down. So this episode is going to be kind of interesting in that regard. Again, thanks to Ryan. This is so cool. And best of luck to him. Like, I know that he has got so much success in his future. And I'm looking forward to seeing where his career goes. Because already, like, he's the same. I know so many amazing people all the same age as me. And uh, Ryan, yeah, uh, he's been killing it so far in his career. It's always been fun from afar to look at what he's doing. And I feel like this is like another big shift for him. So this is going to be really cool. All right. So that being said, I'll be back next episode doing a Q&A. Until then, rock on.